HI stands for Humanistic Intelligence. It's the framework of all our work here in the lab. People always ask me my opinion about AI, artificial intelligence. Well, AI is cool, but at the same time, it's also very, very cold. To me, HI is AI with heart and soul. It's about enhancing a species rather than creating a new one. In HI feedback loop, human and computer work together appears as one entity. When we make wearable computers, we follow the HI framework. Just as human uses computer as peripheral, the computer uses human's mind and body as its peripheral too. We were talking about STEM for the past few years, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What's missing here is the heart and soul. According to Steve, the new term that we should be mentioning is dust. Design, art, science, and technology. That's why we believe a good work here in HI Lab is more than just a program without bugs or a piece of hardware that's 10 times faster. We want you to find the intersection of what you really like and what you're really good at. To me, that's the heart and soul for you as an engineer. Hello, so my name's Steve Mann, and I'm gonna be talking about a few of my inventions. Since my childhood, I've been an inventor and I like to invent things. And um, um, I started with digital eyeglasses. When I was four years old, my grandfather taught me to weld and I sort of got interested in seeing things and trying to see really bright things. And so I built these eyeglasses. And so I wanna talk about phenomenal augmented reality, advancing technology for humanity. And so this is the old ITAP system, kind of uh, digital eyeglass, cumbersome crude apparatus from the, I did in the 1970s and 1980s. That's my 1995 passport as a cyborg. And uh, there's my firstborn child, 2004, and so on. So this eyeglass looks like a glass eye. You, you can kind of see this thing, and it, it, it kind of substitutes the vision. An another invention I had was the smartwatch, 1998, cover of Linux Journal 19, uh, in 2000. And now we see the smartwatch has come into being quite a bit now. We see a lot of them around. Um, we've done a number of startups, uh, company Meta, my, my my student, uh, Raymond Lowe, is the CTO. We got Interaxon. My student, Chris Amini, is the CTO. So we got lots of companies that we've started here. Meta is an example, the Meta Glasses, the Muse, the Interaxon, uh, Visioner Tech, HDR eyeglasses to help people see better. And Splash Tones, the world's first uh, underwater musical instrument, which is, you don't have to be underwater to play it, but you know, it's full of water and it makes sound from vibrations in liquid. Experience the voice of water. Uh, as chief scientist of the Rotman School of Management's Creative Destruction Lab, part of my role is to sort of help people starting business as an entrepreneur. Something I call inventorpreneurship, invention and entrepreneurship. Going back to my childhood, this is one of my early wearable computers. I built this when I was 12 years old in 1974. And this device, I called it the sequential wave imprinting machine because it imprints on the retina. It allowed me to see radio waves. I noticed all around us, there's this technology spying on us and watching us. I see these, all these motion sensors that are sensing us. And I wanted to be able to see the invisible field uh, of this sensing. And so this is a two and a half kilowatt television receiver with picks up television signals or other signals and amplifies them to create phenomenon augmented reality. What I notice is if I walk around with a television receiver tuned to a TV, 
station and move it around, I get video feedback. And usually you walk around and hold, move the camera around and have the TV sit still. But I'd pick the TV up and move the TV around and let the camera sit still. And I noticed that the TV glowed brightly whenever the camera could see it. And so I discovered this strange phenomenon where I could actually see what a camera could see by moving a receiver around. And so I built this amplifier to make that phenomenon really simple. I realized I only need a one pixel display. I don't need a whole TV. So that one pixel display is this uh, one and a half kilowatt light bulb. And this is what it looks like when you walk around with a TV in a dark room and the TV picks up a signal from the camera. I discovered that all of a sudden I can see what the camera can see, this otherwise invisible, what I call a sight field, or meta-sensing, sensing, sensing, and sensing the capacitor of capacity of sensors to sense. And so when I took my lights and waved them around in front of the camera, it painted out this nice little picture of what the camera can see. And, you know, a meta-conversation is a conversation about conversations. A meta-joke is a joke about jokes. So I called this meta-sensing. It's seeing sight, visualizing vision, and sensing sensors. And the other thing I did was to see radio waves. I was able to get radio waves to be visible. And this is not really a standing wave. The radio wave's traveling at the speed of light. And what I was able to do is to get it to sit, to sit still, you know, down boy, sit. Finally, this thing is sitting. It's not like a skipping rope or a violin string that's a standing wave, but it's actually a sitting wave. There's a standing wave. You can see it goes from positive to negative amplitude, and by comparison, here's a sitting wave. You can see the difference here. And so I used this artistically. In the 1980s, I used to do a lot of visualization. Here's a circularly polarized radio wave being visualized, and this is, was used as commercial photography advertisement. I don't know if the people really knew what that was for, but it's an interesting pattern artistically. And of course, the proverbial hello world this is the sequential wave and printing machine on ex at the uh, National Gallery in Ottawa. And uh, so you can see the little machine, the wearable computer with a shoulder strap, and had a Polaroid camera to allow me to instantly visualize radio waves or sight fields of cameras. And after 42 years, this machine still works. Here's Neil Harbison, the colorblind cyborg, visualizing some radio waves with LEDs this time. Same uh, radio sat picking up the signal sequential wave and printing machine. And my nine-year-old daughter made this little robot to visualize and see the sequential wave and printing machine. So the sequential wave and printing machine is very simple. I combined two of my inventions, the smartwatch and the sequential wave and printing machine. Here, here it is here. And so if I take, uh, let me just say, if I go like this, you can see the radio waves from my phone here. And you can see that in, in real time. You can actually see that. <laughs> I don't know if everyone back there can see it or not, but there it is. And you see, if I come closer to the phone, the waves get stronger in amplitude. And when I'm further away, they're weaker. And if I go through my head, they're weaker. And if I hold my phone like this, you can see them. But if I hold my phone like this, they get really weak. I can hardly see them. So if you're talking, hello, how come you can't hear me? Because I'm blocking all the signal with my hand. So smart people who know how to use a phone properly hold it like this. Hello, now it's really clear because I'm not blocking it. And so you can learn a lot <coughs> by this if I come through my coat. I don't block it too much, but if I try to go through my hand or my head, it eats up all the energy. All this microwave goes into your brain and doesn't get out to the real world. So now we can kind of understand and see. <coughs> and so we made this little robot, Pete and uh, Kyle and I, a little swim bot. <coughs> and this little robot displays the radio waves from a microwave motion sensor, you know, the motion detector that you have on your roof. And this little bot swings back and forth, takes a little while to settle down. Hey, is Kyle here? Do you guys want to come up for a second? Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, everyone come and see it in the reception, and you can talk to us. And so there we have it, a radio wave visible. So that wave from this microwave motion sensor has been made visible. And if I put my hand around it, you can see how weak the signal becomes. If I wave my hand there, it kind of messes with it a little bit. <laughs> if I put some piece of metal like this tripod in front of it, it's going to attenuate the signal quite a bit and mess it up. And so you can kind of experiment. As a scientific tool for visualization and understanding, it really helps us understand the world that we live in. <coughs> and here uh, is, uh, you can see it right here on my, my hand. <coughs> and of course, we can visualize surveillance cameras. Here's a surveillance camera, and I'm visualizing its sight field with this 
apparatus, the sequential wave and printing machine. There's a couple of examples here of making visible the otherwise invisible world of surveillance. All around us there's valence, there's internet of things. All these things are watching us and yet we can't see them. The things are getting smaller and more pervasive and yet at the same time they're becoming invisible. And so in our building there's, there's no hand wash faucets or urinals and, or toilets that don't have cameras in them. And although the pixel count is very, fairly small, they're only usually 128 pixels or 1,024 pixels. They, not enough of course to recognize faces but enough to, to collect a sight field and be able to re report or respond through phenomena augmented reality and see them. I just wrote an instructable, by the way, uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, just a couple of hours after I wrote it, it, it got featured. So if you go to instructables.com, you'll be able to see phenomenal augmented reality. I call it phenomenal augmented reality because it's augmented reality of physical phenomena. <coughs> and all around us, there's, there's things spying on us, and we don't know how much they can see us and how much we can see them. So it creates an interesting, from the s issues of privacy, we can quantify these sensors that are sensing us <coughs> and understand this otherwise invisible secret world of sensors. Now there, this, what we do, we can look at these through the eyeglasses and we can see the otherwise invisible world. The eyeglasses gives us a whole new world of phenomenal augmented reality. If you do that instructable, I've made it really simple so that my children can do it. And uh, uh, my kids, you know, I have two daughters and they can do it and so can my students replicate this result. So I kind of discovered this interesting phenomenon and then I made a really simple way that all of you can make one and, and, and observe the phenomenon. But ideally what we want to do is build this into eyeglasses so that you walk around and see the eyeglasses. This is going back many years, Nicholas Negroponte director of the Media Lab, describing how I founded the MIT Wearable Computing Project as its first member. Totally different. It's, 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 it's a very, very different time for us. <laughs> Steve Mann was uh, building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe, was very much something that people thought, well, this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense. And when he arrived here, a lot of people sort of said, wow, this is very interesting, and faculty became more interested, and he, and it's a, I think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed, and then it sort of, you know, it grew, and there are many people now, so-called cyborgs in the media lab, and uh, people working on wearable computers all over the place. What I've got is I've got a computer screen in my glasses. I've been experimenting with uh, something, uh, what you might call um, wearable computing or person, you know, personal computing. The real thing here is that it replaces a lot of the normal things that we carry, such as camcorder, uh, still camera, um, Walkman, um, pager, cell phone. All of those personal electronics items are subsumed into a single apparatus because you know, I have a camera built into the glasses so that as I look around, the algorithm that I've developed seamlessly stitches multiple pictures together and makes them into an image composite, something I call painting with looks. And that invention, you'll probably see that around a lot now on, on camera phones where you can stitch images together. This is going back many years. And here's, so I started this wearable computing project at MIT and we started uh, started with m just myself and then there was six of us and it sort of grew from there. <coughs> this is my welding helmet from, from years ago and what it allowed me to do is to see a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one as video. And we've got some really exciting, fun uh, video processes. You can see this example here. So on the right, there's two different exposures, dark and light video, and they're quantigraphically combined together to produce, to basically make the camera function as an array of light meters. 
Again, the dark and light image being combined together is the video in the eyeglasses so that we can see the eyeglasses actually help people see better. In this case, you need three exposures because of the mirror glinting. But imagine if we could improve driver safety from harsh lighting conditions. How many times have you been uh, driving when there's a sunset or something shining in your eyes? And it actually can be unsafe if you don't see well. And what we can do is improve quality of life and safety for many people, especially people who have trouble seeing in high contrast situations. And so this is a early prototype here as well. So we can see we've got, you know, some, you know, 30 or 40 years of history here of wearable computing. This is going back to 1998. This design is just a, a, a slim frame going around, no hinges, just a loop of metal, laser eye tap. Here's another look at it here. And then this is the one more modern version. Here's one uh, that we made back in 1998. Most of these are from that era. And so we've had this around as a digital eyeglass. We've started a number of companies. We've got uh, one of our projects is this Metaglass. Metaglasses are space glasses where you can see and understand augmented reality overlay in 3D with gesture-based wearable computing and inter interaction. And so here we're interacting with a back of graphic content, much like this. You know, when I have my, my radio waves here, if I can visualize that, I can grab onto it and experience it in 3D with the Metaglasses. Phenomenal augmented reality. This is Jay's Hansen. Uh, experimenting with one of my pipes here. And uh, he's the uh, graphical user interface designer for a lot of the movies like Hunger Games, Ender's Game, and so on. And so he's probably Hollywood's number one graphical user interface designer. And now he's one of our employees at Meta working with us to invent the future of computing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.